Good morning. This is Kenny Burns, pastor of the Open Door Church in Hawkeye, Missouri, uh, coming to you with another live, live stream um, from the Open Door Church. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about events that are closely connected to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, our, our final lesson on this particular series of sermons. And this lesson is entitled, Where Believers Spend Eternity. It's based on Isaiah chapter 65, verse number 17, which is a verse that will sound very familiar to you from the New Testament because Jesus uh, quoted this from the New Testament in the book of Revelation. Um, Isaiah 65, 17 says this, Behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Let's read that one more time. Behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that it goes out today on this live stream uh, in, in a way that it's clear and understandable so that the people can receive it and process it and and Lord, their, their faith will be strengthened and their eyes will be opened to see things from your scripture that perhaps they've never seen before. And Father, as a result of that, they'll grow spiritually. And Lord, there may be somebody watching this live stream who has never fully understood and believed what we call the Jesus story. And because they've never believed it, they've never received the priceless gift of eternal life. And so Lord, if that's the case today, as I, as I conclude this lesson with a brief explanation of the Jesus story, Lord, would you help someone believe it and receive your priceless gift? Because I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, and amen. And so, as we look at this lesson, where believers spend eternity, the, the reason for my offering this lesson is that um, I think maybe the majority of Christians today, especially Christians in America, may have... Uh, uh, a little bit of a misconception about where Christians, where believers spend eternity. Most of us have the idea that um, believers are going to spend eternity in that place that we call heaven as it is today. Um, and I think we're going to be able to see from these scriptures that's not exactly accurate. Heaven as it exists today is a temporary uh, place uh, that is going to be replaced by a new heavens and a new earth. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So kind of fasten your seatbelts and get ready for this as I begin to explain to you what the scriptures reveal to us about where believers are going to spend eternity. You see, the spirits of believers who die before the return of Christ are immediately transported into the presence of the Lord Jesus. Paul wrote it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. He wrote, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, I want you to notice from that scripture, uh, Paul indicates that the spirits of believers are either at home in the body, that's why we're still living here in these physical bodies, or we are present with the Lord. When our spirit leaves these bodies and physical death occurs, our, our, our spirit is, is immediately present with the Lord. Um, just, just that quickly, we are either here or we are there. When Jesus left planet Earth, he, he returned to his father and he took the seat of highest honor at God's right hand where he intercedes for his people. That's where he is today. Jesus is seated at the right hand of his father and he's interceding for us. Paul wrote it like this in Romans chapter 8 verse number 34. He wrote, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So Jesus is at the right hand of the father in what we call heaven today. And, and when believers die, they are immediately transported from their bodies into the very presence of the Lord because they are present with the Lord. If the Lord is at the right hand of the Father and we are present with the Lord, then we are going where Jesus and his Father are today. That's what we call heaven. Now, God the Father is consistently 
declared in Scripture to be in heaven. For example, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. In other words, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I want you to notice that. Our Father, which art where? In heaven. That's where the Father is today, in that place that we call heaven. That's where Jesus went and sat down at his right hand. And when we leave here, that's where we go at this present time. But that arrangement is only a temporary arrangement. That's what I want us to see in this lesson today. So again, when believers die, their spirits are immediately transported to heaven, where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. However, heaven, as it exists at this point, is not the eternal state or the eternal condition, the eternal dwelling place of believers. The present heaven will eventually be destroyed by fire. Peter wrote about that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. He wrote this, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. Now, he used the word heavens there in the plural sense because in the New Testament, um, we are told that there are actually three heavens. The Apostle Paul was caught up to what he called the third heaven. That's that heaven where God is today. The first heaven is the heaven here where the atmospheres are, where the birds fly. Uh, they're referred to in scripture as the fowls of the heaven. And then the second heaven is beyond our atmosphere, out there where the planets are. We call that outer space. Um, sometimes the, the planets and the stars are referred to as heavenly bodies. And then beyond that is the third heaven where God is. But if you notice here, he uses that, that word heaven in the plural sense, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, notice he said everything, including all three heavens, will be destroyed in this way. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and, this, and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. So again, we find that, that the heavens as they exist today are going to be destroyed, and they are going to be replaced, we will see, by a new heaven and a new earth. The destruction of the present heavens and earth evidently occurs at the end of that millennial reign of Christ, that thousand-year reign of Christ that we talked about a few weeks ago when God destroys the enemies of his son by fire. John described this scene in the Revelation in chapter 20, verses 7 to 9, when he wrote, When the thousand years are over, that's this thousand-year reign of Christ right here on earth, Satan will be released from his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. And then he mentions that second battle of Gog and Magog, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves, which we explained before is the city of Jerusalem. The second battle of Gog and Magog takes place in the vicinity of the city of Jerusalem in Israel. And then notice what he says in the next sentence. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. It's evidently that same fire that destroys the enemies of God at the end of the millennial reign of Christ here on earth that will also um, destroy the heavens and the earth and all of the elements and everything in the earth will be burned up by this fire. So then the question is, if heaven is not the eternal place where believers are going to spend eternity, that is heaven as we know it today, then where is that place where we will spend eternity? Where will believers spend forever? That's the question that we're going to attempt to answer in the balance of this lesson today. Uh, Peter continued to write in the verses that uh, that we had read a few moments ago in Second Peter chapter 3, uh, in, in verse number 13, he said this, but in keeping with his promise, he had said that the heavens and the earth are, are going to disappear, they're going to melt in the heat, but in keeping with his promise, 
we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So you see there's going to be a new earth surrounded by a new heaven, and that is the place where believers will spend eternity. Peter declared uh, that God had made a promise and that his people were looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise. And the promise of God was the creation of a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell forever. And the righteous will be there living forever. Peter may um, have simply been repeating a promise that God had already made to mankind uh, through the pen of the prophet Isaiah, that verse that we started with in this lesson. Behold, God had said through Isaiah centuries before Peter wrote this, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. And so Jesus reveals the fulfillment of this promise to John, um, who described it when he wrote the words of Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 5. You know, the Revelation is a series of visions that God gave John to reveal to him some things that, that he was going to do that were yet future to John, and many of them are yet future to us. And John wrote this in one of those visions. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And he could see that because God was fulfilling the promise to create a new heaven and a new earth. And so he says that, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And again, there is biblical evidence that heaven as we know it today is only temporary and it will ultimately pass away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the older order or the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So the old order is gone. Life, earth, heaven, as we know it today, is gone and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. In eternity, God's people will live in perfect peace and blessedness on this new earth surrounded by the new heaven. Jesus will rule his people on the new earth from his capital city, New Jerusalem. Uh, John uh, wrote about that in a quite lengthy reading that I want to read to you from Revelation 21 verses uh, 9 through uh, 27. Notice what he wrote here. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the, of the last plagues came and said to me, Come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Uh, consistently in the New Testament, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is called his bride. And, and so John says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you where the bride is in this vision. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So you see, um, just prior to the destruction of heaven as we know it today, the new Jerusalem descends from heaven down to this new earth surrounded by the new heaven. And, and he says that it's shown with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three on the north and three on the south and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So memorialized in this wall surrounding the capital city of the new earth, the new Jerusalem, um, is not only the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament, but also the 12 apostles of the church in the New Testament, uh, indicating to us that there will be both Old Testament and New Testament believers in uh, this new earth surrounded by this new heaven and they are memorialized in the capital city, New Jerusalem. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city. 
its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square. Actually, it's a cube. Uh, and I think if we, if we do a little research, we'll be able to find that this is a cube. In fact, he's going to go on and explain that to us. He says that it's not only as, as long as it is wide, which would make it a square, but he, and he measured the city with a rod and he found it to be 12,000 stadia or 1,400 miles in length and as wide and high as it is long. So it is 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles long, and 1,400 miles high, making it a cube. What an astounding place that must be. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits. A cubit is about the distance from the elbow to the longest finger of a Jewish man, which is approximately 18 inches. So this, uh, this 144 cubits is approximately 200 feet thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth the ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. Huge pearls had to be uh, uh, at the disposal of God in order to make these gates, each one of a single pearl. The gates, the great street of the city was of pure gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Evidently, there will be pilgrimages led by the kings of the earth who rule in the new earth. They are surrounded by the new heaven, Jerusalem will be capital city, and these kings will bring into the capital city all of their splendor and present it to the king of kings who rules from that city, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only people to inhabit the new earth surrounded by this new heaven are going to be those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those people then will be regularly part of these pilgrimages that come to the capital city to bring the wealth and the splendor of the nations as an offering to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one we call the Lord Jesus Christ. The only people to populate that new earth, I want to say this again, and have access to the new Jerusalem are those whose names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. John wrote about it there in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 27. Nothing impure will enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only way to get your name recorded in this book is to receive God's incredible gift of eternal life by believing in the Lord Jesus. He said this in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, since we've talked about where these believers are going to spend eternity, that it's not in heaven as it currently exists, but it is going to be on the new earth surrounded by the new heaven and, and making pilgrimages into the new Jerusalem to constantly uh, and regularly worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, whose name is Jesus. Um, it would be 
uh, derelict in my duties, it would be um, the height of cruelty for me to tell you what is potentially yours without telling you how you can be sure that your place to spend eternity will be that place. Because you see, the only other option is to spend eternity in the lake of fire. So I wanna close this lesson today by again telling you the Jesus story, by again explaining to everybody who may be listening that the only way you're going to get into ultimately this place that we've just talked about, the new earth surrounded by the new heaven and spend forever with Jesus there is if you believe his story. You see, that's what he said, John 3, 16. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him, that means to believe this Jesus story, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I want to tell you that story. I want to tell you what it is that you need to believe uh, so that you can have this incredible gift of eternal life. Uh, you got to believe this Jesus story, and I want to give you just kind of a, a short version of that today. Uh, the story goes something like this. Way back in eternity past, before God had ever created anything, he already knew that he was going to create Adam and Eve. He knew that they would multiply and, and replenish the earth. He knew that there would be an entire race of creatures that we call human beings. But he also knew that when he gave Adam one command, don't eat from the fruit in the middle of the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve would break that command, they would eat of that fruit, they would become sinners, and all of their descendants would be sinners as well. That sin would ultimately separate them from God because they would be sinners not only in their nature but also in their behavior. And when they, when they sinned against God, that sin would separate them from God. Isaiah said it like this back in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, your sins have separated between you and your God. And, and you see, every human being has sinned. Romans 3.23 says that. It says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and you see, it's important that we understand that because if we never confess to ourselves and to God that we have sinned, we will never be concerned about the consequences of sin. And the consequences are grave. In fact, Paul described those consequences, at least the worst of those consequences, in Romans chapter 6, verse number 23, when he said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need to talk about those wages of sin. Wages are what you earn for what you do. What we've done is sin. What we've earned is death. And there are three kinds of death, and we have earned all three. There's physical death. That happens when your spirit leaves your body. James said it like this. He said the body without the spirit is dead. And then everybody's going to face that because Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 27 says that it is appointed to men once to die, and after that, the judgment. Everybody is going to face physical death. Everybody's spirit is going to leave their body at some point, and it's our responsibility as Christians to make sure, as sure as we possibly can, that their spirit goes to the right place instead of to the wrong place, because there are only two options. And then, once we understand physical death, we need to understand spiritual death. Spiritual death happens when you've sinned and you haven't done anything about it, and your sin stands between you and God, separates you from him. God loves you, and he wants to pump his eternal life into your human spirit so you can live forever with him on this new earth surrounded by this new heaven. But your sin stands in the way and cuts you off from his eternal life, separates you from him. And so because his life is not flowing into your spirit, your spirit is dead because the wages of sin is death. The third kind of death is by far the worst kind. It's what I call eternal death. Peter warned people about this in the New Testament. He said they should avoid this at all costs when he warned them to, to avoid what he called the eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord, being banished from God's presence forever. You miss heaven as we know it today. You miss eternity on the new earth surrounded by the new heaven, and you wind up in the lake of fire. That's the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to any human being. All three kinds of death is what we have earned because of our sin. And if that verse in Romans 6.23 stopped with the wages of sin is death, period, the Bible would be a very sad story indeed. But fortunately, the verse doesn't stop there. There's not a period after death. There is a comma, and the verse goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see, we've got two options do nothing about our sin, and, and then we, uh, we get the wages of, 
of, of death, all three kinds of death. Or we can take God's solution for our sin problem, which comes in the form of a gift. He said, the gift of God is eternal life. You see, this whole concept of living forever with Jesus on the new earth, surrounded by the new heaven, is a gift. You can't earn it. If you earned it, it would be um, compensation or wages. You can't buy it. If you could buy it, it would be a purchase. It's a gift. And when somebody offers you a gift, you only have two alternatives. You can either receive it or reject it. You can take it or you can turn it down. The way that you receive this gift is to believe the Jesus story, to believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to purchase the gift for you and he offers it to you as a free gift because he loves you and he wants you to have it. You see, that's what a gift is. A gift is something somebody else buys and they offer it to you freely because they love you and they want you to have it. That's the way eternal life is. Jesus did everything necessary when he died on the cross and then descended into hell so that we could have the gift of eternal life. You see, the scripture says that in Romans 5 eight. It says um, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Us. You see, when he died on the cross, he's hung there and he suffered and he bled, he agonized, he convulsed, he suffocated. Ultimately, he died. And when he did that, he was taking all of the physical punishment you and I deserve because of our sin. Then he had died. They took his body down, they put it in the tomb, they put the stone in front of the entrance, but his spirit had already left his body. And, and ultimately, his spirit went to heaven as we know it today. And he sat down at the right hand of God, which we read about earlier. And he's there making intercession for us. He's there offering the gift of eternal life to everybody who will believe his story. But before he went to heaven, Jesus did something equally as dramatic. Before he went to heaven, he actually descended into hell for us. He actually went to hell for us. And in hell, he experienced what we deserve to experience spiritually because of our sin. He told his disciples he was going to do that weeks before he died. He brought up the story of Jonah and the whale. And he said, just like Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, even so the Son of Man, that's what Jesus called himself, will spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And we could argue about everything that may be in the heart of the earth, but one thing is certain, and that is that hell is in the heart of the earth. You see, Jesus was telling them that one of the things that I'm going to do between uh, my death on the cross and my resurrection in the tomb is that I'm going to go into the heart of the earth. I'm going to go to hell for you. And he did exactly that. And when he got to hell, Satan slammed the gates and locked them. I'm certain that a party broke out in hell. There were demons dancing all over hell. They thought they had won and they were celebrating. They thought they could use the gates of hell to keep Jesus incarcerated there. But when he had finished his three-day mission of taking the spiritual punishment for the whole world, all that we deserve because of our sin, then suddenly Jesus pulled a key out of his robe because the revelation says that he has the key of death and hell. He made his way to the gate and stuck the key in the lock. He turned the key. He threw the gates of hell open. He marched out of hell victorious over death and hell and the grave. He made his way into that tomb where they placed his body back into his body and he rose from the dead. We still celebrate that 2,000 years later and we call it Easter. Angels showed up and rolled the stone away and Jesus, a certifiably dead man who had died physically on a cross and died spiritually when he went to hell for us, was back and he was alive again. That had never happened before in human history. There were women at the tomb on that first Easter morning. And when they saw him alive, they ran away screaming, he's alive, he's alive. And then God let Jesus stay here for about 40 days to appear to different people in different places to prove that he was alive. And then he had a prearranged meeting with his disciples out on a mountainside. And during that meeting, he basically told them to go tell everybody on the planet and every generation this story. He said it like this, go make disciples of all nations. Because you see, my friend, nobody can ever get off this planet alive. Nobody will ever get to heaven as it exists today. Nobody will ever be on the new earth surrounded by the new heaven for all eternity in the presence of Jesus unless they hear and believe this story. You see, you, you can't believe something you've never heard. You can't believe something you don't understand. So it is our responsibility to be telling this story to everybody on the planet and tell it to them in a way that they can understand it, process it, and believe it so they can receive eternal life. That's what John 3.16 says. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son 
so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But then the thinking person must ask themselves the question, how strongly must I believe the story in order to receive the gift? And the answer is, you've got to believe the story strongly enough that you're willing to do the only sane thing anybody could ever do if they truly believe the story. And that's to call on Jesus, the author of the story, to receive his incredible gift of eternal life. Romans 10, 13 says that. It says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To call on someone means to ask them for what you need. You need eternal life if you don't have it. You need it more than you need anything else. And the way you get it is to believe his story and then call on him to receive it as a gift. And if you do that, he says he'll give it to you because he says you will be saved. Not might be, not hope so, not maybe so, not I'm working on it, but you will be saved. Saved means rescued rescued from eternal death because you've been given the incredible gift of eternal life. I'm aware that there may be somebody listening to this live stream today who has maybe never never heard the story. Oh, maybe you've been to church a lot in your life and you've heard little bits and pieces of the story, but you've never really heard a, a, an overview of the story. And today, you're having that moment that moment of engagement between you and the Holy Spirit where he is showing you that the story is true. You understand it, and you're in a position now to believe it. It's my prayer that you'll believe it so strongly that you'll call on Jesus in a simple prayer to receive his gift of eternal life. And I want to help you do that. I want to help you pray that prayer. I can't pray it for you, but I can help you with it. And I'd like to do that just now. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for everybody listening today. And Lord, for those who are listening that may not have ever fully understood the story before, but they understand it today and your Holy Spirit is convincing them that it's true. Father, just now, would you help them fully believe the story? Believe it so strongly that they're willing to call on Jesus to receive his incredible gift of eternal life in a little prayer that says, Dear Jesus, I do believe in you. I want the gift of eternal life, and I'm willing to receive it as a gift just now. I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I, I would ask you to let us know about that. Uh, you can check out the Open Door Church's uh, webpage or our Facebook page and send us a message and let us know who you are and that you prayed to receive the gift of eternal life today because we would like to begin praying for you that God would bless you and help you take the next step on your journey with him. And if you're listening today and you're already a believer, you already know that you have eternal life. And by the way, you can know. 1 John 5, 13 says that. John said his whole reason for writing the book of 1 John was so that you can know that you have eternal life. He said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so if you already know you have eternal life today, then I want to challenge you. Tell the story to everyone that you possibly can, everyone who's willing to listen. God bless you all. Um, we don't know what the next week is going to hold, whether we're going to still do live stream or whether we're going to be able to uh, be back in a, in a public meeting again. Uh, we plan to still do live stream once we begin our public meetings again, but um, I hope to see you either, either on live stream or at the Open Door Church in Hawkeye, Missouri as soon as the pandemic is over and we can begin to have public meetings again. God bless each of you. In Jesus' name, amen.